Please be seated. Wow, so how does that gospel make you feel? That's a cheery one, isn't it? So let me, let, let's see if we can help out a little bit with this this morning. So the master God bestows upon us things that we don't ask for. Those servants, those slaves, never asked for those talents. God just gave them to them. And so for some, they got five, and for others, they got two, and for the third, he got one. But they all got something, right? They all got something according to their abilities. So God provides for us based on what we need. What I want to focus on, though, is what they did with the talents that they had, because I think that's the lesson that Jesus was trying to teach the disciples and therefore trying to teach us. So talents back then were a weight of silver. So each talent was actually about 110 pounds worth of silver. So back then, that's a lot of money, right? Because the average weight of a human being back then was 110 pounds. They were a whole lot shorter back then, right? <laughs> so we're talking a lot of money. We're talking a whole lot of money. So God invests a lot in us. He gives us a lot of gifts and a lot of skill and with abundance. But some of us, let's think back to our high school days for those of us that are beyond high school. And for you that are younger than high school, you can relate to this on your day-to-day -day basis. You all have friends and we were in high school, we all had those friends who were really good in sports right? They were really popular. They probably were really good looking. They were good in, in academics. They seemed like they had it all, right? Everybody can picture that person back in your high school days or college days. Yeah, so that's the five talent person, okay? And then you got your run-of-the-mill person, the one who's got two talents. Maybe they're good at sports and they're popular, or maybe they're good in math and science. So they get good grades, they went to a good school. Or maybe they were really good in the fine arts, they could really sing, so they got a whole lot of uh, attention because of their, their voice or their ability to dance, right? One or two things. And then you get the mother nans of the world, right? You get one talent. For me, I wasn't very good in school back then. I really could care less, to be honest. Uh, but I was really good at stage lighting. That was my gift. You know, I could take a stage and I could make it look like something spectacular. So that's where I put all my talent. But what happens is you take your talents and you use them. So the first two, the five talent and the two talent holder, what did they do? Come on. They doubled them. How did they double them? Yeah, they used them. They shared them. They invested in them, right? And because they invested in them, they doubled their income. They doubled what they had. So what does the, what does the third guy do? He takes his one talent, and what does he do with it? He buries it. Do we remember why he buries it? He's afraid, exactly. He takes his one talent, and he buries it because he's afraid. He's got that voice in his head that says, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not good looking enough. You got two left feet and you're tone deaf. So we don't look at what we have, we look at what we don't have. So when I was at, in St. Matthew's in Snellville, we had a choir that was struggling. Um, the choir was more than struggling. The choir at one point was, was not very good. And I would sit in the pew, and I would go, oh, my gosh, they're horrible. <laughs> they're just horrible. And then I wasn't the only one. But at coffee hour, I had a group of people who would go, and we would all talk about how bad the choir was. Another cup of coffee, oh, my gosh. Did they get any notes right? Right? We've all been there, right? We've all had that conversation with somebody. And one day I was sitting in the, in the pew, and I think they were trying to sing the psalm, if I remember right, and it was just painful. And suddenly I realized 
you know what, instead of complaining, why don't you do something about it? Now, I don't have a good voice, you all know. I don't have a powerful voice. It's accurate. You know, if somebody says, sing a C, I can sing a C. But I'm by no means, you know, a maestro. But anyway, I got up and I, I joined the choir. And when I joined the choir, the choir where we were sat up here. So everybody saw you. You were on the altar. Everybody saw. And suddenly it was like, oh, well, wait a minute. Nancy's been picking on the choir. Now she's part of them? What's up with that? So I started to invite more and more people to join the choir with me. All my naysayer friends in the coffee, I went to them. I said, you know what? Instead of complaining about him, maybe we should all try to help him. Because Dan's really doing a great job. He just doesn't have as many voices to sing the parts that he wants. So over about a year and a half or so, the choir started to build. And by the time we hit Easter, we were singing the Hallelujah Chorus, and they were doing lessons and carols, and, and they're still thriving. But it's not because I did anything. It's because I took my one little talent, and I decided to do something good with it. I decided not to bury it. I decided to share it. And what was even more amazing is suddenly I had a whole group of friends that I didn't know before that. I met a whole circle of people in the church that I had never engaged with before. And a lot of those folks ended up being on my discernment committee when I said I wanted to be a priest. And those folks still pray for me and still call me and still check on me, even today. So the church got something, and I got something, right? I doubled my income. So when we sit here at St. Bartholomew's, we're filled with a bunch of talent. We have a church that's growing. And that's what the whole core of this, that's the heart of this message today, is that we are called as disciples to take the talents that we have and use them to grow and spread the church. That's what we're here for. And St. Bartholomew's is growing. We've got former parishioners who are starting to come back. We've got new parishioners that are coming in. And those that have been here for a while are probably, you know, you can get a little itchy, right? Church starts to grow and we all start talking about St. Bartholomew's and how big it's going to get. And we got a new snappy website. And, you know, we start talking about all these new programs. And it's just natural to become afraid, just like the one guy with the talent, right? He got scared because he thought he knew what the master was going to do. So we think we know what the future is going to look like when suddenly we have a whole bunch of new people here. You know what it's going to look like when we have a whole bunch of new people here? These two pews right here, guess what? They're going to be people sitting in their lives like this. The pumpkin patch, still going to be here. But it have, instead of signing up for two shifts, guess what? You're only going to have to sign up for one shift. <laughs> right? The things that St. Bartholomew's loves, the things that make St. Bartholomew's St. Bart's, still going to be here. They're just going to be more vibrant. They're going to be more alive. We're all going to be less tired. Right? We're already a face of North Augusta. God gave us that. That's all God's work. So the more people we bring in here, the more vibrant our ministries are, the healthier we are, the healthier the church is. Who we are is not going to change. God made us who we are. So that's the glory of using our talents and not being afraid. We have nothing to be afraid of. So this is not a gospel of fear or damnation. This is a gospel of hope. This is a gospel that should encourage each of us to reach in and see what our talents are. And especially at St. Bartholomew's. You know, we're about to go into, we're in the middle of a stewardship campaign, right? But we're also going into vestry elections. We each have the skills to run this church, to have a voice in this church. Pretty soon I'm going to be asking for new committees and, and new programs and new life. Because when new people come in, they don't want to just sit here, my friends. Right? They want to be engaged. So what's the church going to look like when it grows? 
How are we going to use our talents? Next year, I promise you, this church is going to be so much bigger with more love and more grace and more gifts.